So while we're still in Black History Month, uh, I wanted to do a video about uh, its modern, about the modern extension of slavery in the form of our prison system and the broader prison industrial complex. Uh, now, this is no big exaggeration to say that uh, that uh, prisons are extension of slavery. You can actually look at um, when slavery was uh, was abolished. In, uh, in this country under the 13th Amendment and, uh, then, and then watch the prison boom that happened and the move toward chain gangs and prison labor with, uh, and, and the racialization of our prisons. Um, that, you know, and to this day, um, what you find is n nearly one in three black men will be incarcerated at some point in their life. At, uh, it's about one in ten for Latino men, and although uh, women are uh, in prison at much lower rates, uh, nonetheless black women are the fastest growing group of prisoners in this country. Um, so, of course, I mentioned chain gangs. You know, you have prison labor to this day, uh, which is uh, paid a, a fraction of minimum wage. Uh, and thus providing a major source of surplus value to the capitalists who, who profit from that. Uh, we see a disturbing trend today towards private prisons uh, run for profit, contracting with the state. Um, and uh, you also have voter disenfranchisement, where uh, people who were people, largely people of color who have been through the prison system are then, uh, have, then have their voting rights revoked so that uh, you know they can't uh, so that they have no political voice. Um, so I mentioned, you know, there was an acceleration of building prisons after the 13th Amendment, which uh, actually, if you look at the 13th Amendment, it, it says uh, that uh, people should not be forced into involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. So it specifically leaves prison a, as a loophole for for slavery, so that's why I say it's no exaggeration to talk about slavery being extended through the prison system. Um, th there was another prison boom which occurred in the 1980s and 90s, um, which um, uh, which basically, if if you look at California, for instance, um, in 1980 they had a total of nine prisons which had been built over you know, over 100 years. Uh, in the making, um, the, that number doubled in a decade, and it, it tripled by the year two thousand. Um, and of course, I I think I hardly need to tell you about the you know, that prisoners face incredibly brutal conditions, uh, you know, both amongst each other, but also at the hands of the guards. Um, you may know about this experiment that was done in nineteen seventy one called the Stanford Prison Experiment where uh, uh, a psychology professor, Philip Zimbardo, had some of his students um, go into a prison and uh, he divided them up so that some of them were prison guards and others were prisoners. And uh, so when, when taking on these hierarchical roles, it only took a day or two for the uh, prison guards to you know, start to torture, humiliate, and dominate the prisoners in ways that were ex extremely disturbing. Um, and you know, many of them, looking back on it, are just horrified at what they've done. Um, but and and it is a you know very horrifying and, and fascinating experiment to look through in terms of human psychology. But it's important to realize that this stuff that this happens in real prisons. The prison guard prison guards do have this um, you know domineering attitude because because of the position they're in, the hierarchical role that they play. Um, in, in women's prisons, uh, this takes on you know, a, a very sexual uh, dimension. That, I mean, women's prisons are sites of constant sexual abuse by guards. Uh, you know, both you know the stuff that's outside the rules and like outright rape, uh, or, and to you know things that are ostensibly within the rules like strip searches. Which, if if you saw a strip search in any other context outside of outside of prison, you would clearly recognize it as sexual abuse. Uh, but you know, in addition to that, uh, the guards will also uh, use their power to extract sexual favors from them, them or to punish them for not uh, you know, putting out or some of that. So, um, you know, a lot of 
you know, in feminist circles, there's sometimes an overuse of the term rape culture. Well, uh, a, a, if you want to see a real rape culture, look at a prison. Um, women's prisons, I just mentioned. Of course, men's prisons, we've all seen the movies. We all know what goes on there. Um, I don't have the statistics, but I uh, remember reading that um, because of our incarceration rate in this country, men, uh, we might actually be the uh, first country in, in the world where more men get raped than women. Um, so, uh, you know, the term prison industrial complex uh, has become a, a household word now. Um, is obviously a take on the uh, term that Dwight Eisenhower coined, uh, military industrial complex. Now, some people have thought that the prison industrial complex rose to take the place of the military industrial complex, but um, I think we can see now with Iraq and Afghanistan and it, you know, men's of their smaller conflicts were in that uh, the military industrial complex is alive and well. Uh, so prisons, much like the mil much like uh, our military ventures, uh, provide a great source of surplus value for capitalists. Uh, prison labor is one obvious example. Um, we have uh, private prisons now, but we shouldn't place too much emphasis on the private prisons because uh, public prisons are things that corporations profit off of immensely as well. Um, we have police who are in, who are complicit in the racialization of our justice system by uh, targeting certain minority groups that uh, that actually statistically you know use drugs and and get in certain activities less. Than white people, and yet are targeted at much higher rates because they're more vulnerable. Um, and you know, we have laws like like drug laws and anti-prostitution laws, which um, are you know a, a target victimless crimes, and b uh, are enforced unequally so as to target uh, vulnerable groups like that. Um, and uh, you know, in addition to you know profiting off the labor of prisoners, it's important to realize that uh, the corp that in prisons corporations have you know pardon the term a captive market. Um, you know they they have a whole infrastructure they need to support. They need to feed the prisoners. They have to uh, house them. They have to have security de detail. There's a lot of services that need to be provided, and there are a lot of for-profit corporations that are willing to uh, get. They're you know eager to get state contracts to uh, to provide those services, uh, you know, uh, and additionally, um, some you know some firms find that prisons are a great place to carry out experiments, medical experiments, uh, you know, uh, chemical experiments. Um, Johnson and Johnson and Dow Chemical are two companies, for example, that have carried out uh, experiments in prisons, um, and we have a. Uh, you know, vicious cycle in, in uh, particularly new liberal capitalism that has fed the prison industrial complex. Uh, in the 1970s, you know, we started seeing outsourcing of, of jobs overseas, uh, which helped break the back of the unions in this country and caused a lot of unemployment, which uh, left people economically destitute and had to turn to the welfare system. Well, meanwhile, you know, uh, President Clinton uh, declared that. Yeah, you know, decided he was going to reform welfare and say the era of big government is over. So uh, the the welfare state has been has been getting dismantled over this time. So people uh, are more and more destitute. Uh, they don't have jobs. They're uh, they don't uh, the social safety net is slipping from under them. So a lot of them, what a lot of them do, they turn to crime, and um, and you know sometimes even not really really uh, you know violent crime. Just uh, sometimes just in, are in bad situations and turn to drugs to cope, and of course the drugs are. are you know, we saw an acceleration of the drug war during this time, uh, and so of course then they go to prison and become incarcerated. Uh, meanwhile, prisons have been designed not to reform them, not to uh, keep society safe, but to maximize recidivism. And in fact, uh, one one of the most common charges for people in prison is parole violations. Um, so. Uh, that's I, I think that's actually uh, more common than drug um, than um, drug violations, though it should be kept in mind that of course a lot of uh, parole violations do involve drugs, like 
you know, smoking a single joint and, pa and failing a drug test. Um, so when talking about alternatives uh, to this system, um, I don't want to talk about prison reform. I would rather talk about prison abolition. And that may sound uh, shocking and absurd to you. I would suggest that it is no more absurd than the idea of abolishing slavery was to people in the early 19th century. Um, and you know, you ask, well, what alternative do we have to the prison system? And I would suggest that even if we have no no alternative at all, simply stopping this recidivism machine, which trains criminals and you know makes them often more dangerous than they were when they came in, uh, that simply getting rid of this would uh, would be an improvement. Um, but of course, we don't want to stop there. Uh, we we need to look at not just prisons themselves, but the whole prison industrial complex and the machine that feeds it and uh, help, you know, put a cog in that machine. Uh, oh, it'll help break it down. Um, first of all, of course, we, need, we should be decriminalizing uh, victims' crimes like drug use and sex work. Um, we also need to look at our schools. And yeah, it's important to realize that in a lot of inner, a lot of inner city schools particularly, uh, there's a much greater emphasis on discipline and security than there is on knowledge and learning. Uh, and, any t and, and so these schools have essentially become prisoner factories. You know, there, there are certain schools that, uh, a grad that a person who goes to that school is more likely to go to prison than to go to college. Um, and so we obviously need to look at that. Uh, as far as you know, what what to do with people who actually commit crimes, uh, we need to look at restorative justice and see the, the thing is the, the whole logic behind prisons has it backwards. The the idea is that you reform a person by taking them out of society and keeping them in isolation. But the fact is, we are social creatures. We uh, we are improved by being immersed in society and uh, by um, being faced with. Uh, by peers and, uh, and adhering to social norms, and um, and so uh, for many people, the the sort of fate that, that really helps reform is being exposed before their peers, having to face uh, the community and um, make acts of restitution to them. Um, you know, and there and there are many different varieties. This can uh, this can um, uh, there are varieties of uh, forms that this can take. I think um, at the end of apartheid, uh, there was a massive campaign of restorative justice that was very brilliant. Um, so, and then what you might say, okay, well, I'm sure that's fine for some crim some of them, but aren't some of them, you know, just too dangerous to be let out? Aren't some of them just, um, you know, completely psychotic? Well, if they are in fact psychotic and unable to be returned to society, then clearly they have mental problems and their case should be dealt with not as a criminal case, but as a mental health issue. And there, there are problems with our mental health system. That I That is another conversation, which I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak on, but that, that, that is also an area that needs to be addressed. But, you know, the fact is, we do we have more mentally ill people in prison than we do in mental hospitals, and there is something wrong with that. Um, mental hospitals, uh, I said, need to be reformed, but um, but the, all these people need care. They need to be taken care of and given uh, nurturing and compassion that they deserve as human beings. Um, which, of course, we also need to apply to drug addiction. Um, we, uh, people, people need treatment options that they're accessible and affordable, and um, this should not take the form of the compulsory uh, treatment options that are be, being um, administered by a lot of courts these days. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you can't you know, just forcing a person to get off drugs doesn't doesn't work very well. And uh, of course, a lot of these a lot of these compulsory programs just put people through who weren't addicts in the first place, they were just recreational users, you know, and, and doing it to, to avoid prison. But, um, yeah, people should have greater access to drug treatment 
uh, if they if they need it. Um, and but you know most importantly, we need a healthy society that uh, that does not have this sort of uh, drive towards vengeance and does not just lock away our problems and try to ignore them. We need to actually have, have a society that, that is based on a sense of community and uh, community will actually help reform people who have sinned against our society, people who, who have fallen in um, a down, down a wrong road. So the real alternative to the prison industrial complex is to create a society that stops producing criminals. Uh, I'm going to link in low bar a uh, documentary called 3000 Years in Life. It's about a uh, uprising that happened in Walpole Prison in I believe it was 1972. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'll, uh, I'll look it up later. But um, uh, but, but uh, it was in the wake of the Attica uprising. But this one, it was actually a matter of the prisoners basically going on strike and the the guards leaving. So the prisoners actually just ran their own ran the prison, and they didn't go all roughshod like you might expect. They actually um, ran it uh, as a union, and th there was lockdown. There was you know uh, th they still you know acted like like they're in prison, but they also ran things democratically. Uh, they actually managed to eliminate rape, among, you know, in the prison, which of course most prisons have that problem. But uh, they managed to. Uh, they, they had a system of justice where uh, the, where people who had stolen or, or wronged some other prisoner would, instead of you know, being uh, punished or sent to solitary confinement or anything like that, would simply have to face his peers, and they'd you know they'd say, "Hey, why did you do that? Why did you?" Uh, and it would look at them, and it, the person would lower their head in shame and say, "I'm sorry," and they said, "It's all right. You're, you're part of you're part of our family." That's how justice needs to run. It needs to be a matter of being restored to the community. Um, so I'm going to link that uh, that low bar, and it might change your views about what prisoners are like, and um, not be sucked into this view that these are monsters that we're that, that we're hiding. These are people like you and me, um, and uh, and they don't deserve to be you know brought into these cages. So. Uh, uh, that's it for now. Peace.